Tonight, from WLWT, a Commitment 2020 special. What is on the ballot here is the character of this country. Success is going to bring us together. We are on the road to success. Inside the campaigns and the issues, before you cast your ballot. I'm confident the people of Kentucky uh, believe I've done a good job. I think the biggest thing we can do, it really is get rid of him. From the streets to boards of election, we take you beyond the ballot. Here now, WLWT News 5's Stephen Albritton and Ashley Kirkland. Good evening to you. Despite the deep divides in America right now, one thing just about everyone agrees on, this may be the most important election of our lifetime. No doubt it is unlike anything we've seen before. Tonight we will show you where the candidates stand and arm you with the information you need to separate fact from fiction in their messages. We'll start, of course, with the intense battle for the White House. The fiery battle has crisscrossed the country, the candidates clashing on the coronavirus. We have the best test and we are coming around. We're rounding the turn. We have the vaccines. We have everything. We're rounding the turn. Even without the vaccines, we're rounding the turn. There's so much better than this. We can bring back this economy. It starts with my plan to deal with this pandemic responsibly, bringing the country around to testing and tracing and masking, social distancing not politicizing the race for a vaccine. In the debates, President Trump and former Vice President Biden went head to head over racism in America. I am the least racist person. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. Those debates have gone from incomprehensible to measured and descriptive as Trump and Biden laid out very different views on the future of our country. One of the top topics, the future of health care, the president promising a plan to replace Obamacare, but not until the existing law is repealed. We'll always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new beautiful health care. As the former vice president fired back asking for details. He's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the pre-existing condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan. President Trump saying he wants clean air and water, but... I will not sacrifice tens of millions of jobs, thousands and thousands of companies because of the Paris Accord. While former Vice President Biden says the nation needs a new direction. Have a transition from the oil industry, yes, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time. Both of them saying they are the choice to lead us to a better future. Success is going to bring us together. We are on the road to success. What is on the ballot here is the character of this country decency, honor, respect, and I'm going to make sure you get that. But that doesn't mean the candidates always told you the truth. We've been working all year with factcheck.org to get you those facts about what the candidates are saying. The president on Biden's health care plan. When he talks about a public option, he's talking about destroying your Medicare, totally Wrong. destroyed, and destroying your Social Security. Our partners at factcheck.org says that's false, that Joe Biden doesn't support eliminating private insurance in favor of a single-payer health care system. Biden's health care plan builds on the Affordable Care Act and includes a Medicare-style public option as a choice, but also increases tax credits for individuals purchasing their own insurance. Meanwhile, the vice president also being misleading about health care. Ten million people have lost their private insurance and he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions and all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? Our partners at factcheck.org say this is one of Biden's most frequent claims and that it's misleading. The only people who would be at risk of losing all coverage are those who get insurance on the individual or non-group market. That's only about 6%, about 20 million people. Well, the candidates and their running mates also hitting the campaign trail across Ohio, including right here in Cincinnati. Vice President Mike Pence talked with me one on one during his most recent visit, doubling down on the president's claim that we're turning the corner on the coronavirus. We're literally a matter of, we believe, weeks away uh, from having the first safe and effective coronavirus vaccine. We think we'll have that vaccine in the millions of doses available to the American people before the end of this year.
President Pence says that in the meantime, the Trump administration is focused on supporting states. Well, former VP Biden also talked one on one with me during his recent stop here, saying that we can't wait on a vaccine and that we have to focus on the things that will allow businesses and schools to reopen safely, like masks, PPE and dividers and cleaning supplies. And that requires us to take the money that in fact has been voted by the United States Congress and make it available to businesses so they can open safely. Biden says he is opposed to another shutdown in the event of the virus worsening. He says small businesses are the essence of their communities. The bitter campaign fights are not limited to the presidential race. Attacks are flying fast and furious in Kentucky's race for U.S. Senate. Incumbent Mitch McConnell is battling Democratic challenger Amy McGrath. A recent debate hosted by our NBC affiliate in Lexington gives you a compelling look at both the political divisions and the animosity between the two. His one job is to help America through this crisis right now in passing legislation to keep our economy afloat so that people can make ends meet. And instead of doing that, he is trying to ram through a Supreme Court nominee right now. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell shifted that blame to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. What she wanted us to pass was the bill that provided health care for illegals, tax cuts for rich people in New York and California, and had more money in it for Puerto Rico than for Kentucky. The pair also disagreed on how to get control of the virus. The, the uh, coronavirus is not going to go away until we can kill it, and it's going to take the vaccine to do that. And there are other countries that have been able to get this under control, and they've done it with a national testing and tracing plan that we still don't have in this country. As for the hearings that led to Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation, McGrath used McConnell's own words to support her view that the vacancy should not have been filled. Four years ago, Senator McConnell uh, said by the McConnell rule during an election year, uh, we don't vote on a nominee. Let the people decide. They want to completely change the rules in the Senate to give them an advantage. Admit the district of the state. Puerto Rico is a state. That's four new senators for them. And then pack the Supreme Court so they'll get the outcomes they want. When it comes to the Breonna Taylor case, police reforms and the ongoing protests for racial justice, both candidates said they were against defunding the police and in favor of peaceful protests. But they disagreed again on what could be done at the federal level. The Kentucky Senate race takes on even more importance in the national picture. With 35 seats up for election across the country, it won't take a lot to shift the balance of power. Republicans right now hold 53 seats. The Democrats hold 45 with two independents who usually vote with the Democrats. So Republicans want to keep things right here or pick up some seats. Democrats want to pick up at least three seats and win the White House because the vice president cast the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. If they win four seats, they will have an outright majority no matter who wins the presidential race. A fierce battle to represent you in the U.S. House. She says I vote too much with the president. He wants you to believe that I'm an extremist. Fiery rhetoric from very different viewpoints will take you past, uh, take you past the tough talk to find out where the candidates in Ohio's first district stand. And tens of thousands of voters flooding boards and mailboxes. Tonight, we'll show you how safe those ballots are, how they're stored, and the one key factor that officials say protects you and your vote the best.
It's not Democrat or Republican. We need leaders that stand up and bring relief to this community. I'm the one fighting against Pelosi who's blocking this for a second round of PPP loans for those small businesses who didn't get one the first time. Well, the battle for the control of Congress has also been hard fought and at times nasty. One of the most watched races in the country is here in Ohio's first district. That's the fight between incumbent Republican Steve Shabbat and Democratic challenger Kate Schroeder. They have very different views of how the country should move forward. And as we saw when the two met in a debate right here on WLWT. She says, I vote too much with the president. I can guarantee if she ever makes it to Congress, she's going to vote with Nancy Pelosi probably 100% of the time or with those radical leftists. She'll fit right in with them. My opponent has voted over 15 times to take health care away and against coverage for pre-existing conditions. And it's not okay to play politics with people's lives. As you will hear tonight, he will try to paint me to be someone I'm not. He wants you to believe that I'm an extremist and it's just not who I am. The attacks came fast and furious as anchor Sheree Polello questioned the candidates, but both also laid out their own plans, starting with fighting the coronavirus. We need relief in this community. We need support to our schools. We need support for widespread testing so that all of our schools and businesses can stay open safely. We need support for our small businesses in extending the PPP. We need unemployment insurance. And I believe that we have to look at these hand in hand with our public health and with our economic response. We need to defeat this virus. We need to get a vaccine as soon as possible. That's why I have supported funding in the CARES Act. That's why I want another round. Uh, I'm the one fighting against Pelosi who's blocking this for a second round of PPP loans for those small businesses who didn't get one the first time or those that are really hurting who need one this time so they can keep their people employed. That's really important. No justice, no peace. On racial unrest and changes in policing, some agreement, but not much. It's irresponsible to paint these as two alternatives. I think we can be pro-public safety and also be pro fair impartial policing. I'm proud of the progress that Cincinnati has made on that. We've done a lot of the things. What I'm advocating for federally is a lot of the steps that we've done here, banning the chokehold and the stranglehold. It's having increased reporting. It's also having policies around de-escalation and use of force. We absolutely should not defund the police. If anything, we ought to be supporting our police officers more. I offered legislation, and this was after the George Floyd killing, called the Safer Communities Act. She mentioned the Cincinnati Collaborative. That was a good thing where Cincinnati came together after the Timothy Thomas shooting and over the Rhine some year two, back in 2001. I want to make that a model to other communities across the country. Um, also, the disciplinary records for police right now. We don't want a bad cop. There aren't too many, but there are bad cops. We don't want them going from one community to another. So we need to make sure those disciplinary records are available. And on the issue topping many people's list of priorities, health care, a very clear separation between Shabbat and Schroeder about where we are and where we need to be. The American people deserve better than Obamacare has delivered for us. And there are all kinds of things that we need to improve on. We need to reduce prescription drug prices. The costs under what she's for would go up dramatically. Medicare for all. She talks about universal health care. I'm for universal coverage, but what I'm not for is have a government plan where it's completely taken over. By moving towards universal coverage, if everyone has access to health care, it gets the cost down because right now we pay for everyone when they show up in the emergency room. Uh, and you are paying for people on the back end rather than ensuring that people have coverage up front. Access to health care is so fundamental. It is a human right. I believe everyone deserves access to it. Well, tonight we are also tracking the spending in the first district race. The slugfest means a lot of cash is getting thrown around. WLWT News 5 investigative reporter Todd Dykes is cutting through the murky world of fundraising to show you who's footing the bill for all those negative ads. Well, ultimately, bitter means big bucks. As a comparison, in 2016, Steve Shabbat held onto a seat in a race where both candidates combined to spend just under a million dollars. This year, Shabbat and Schroeder have spent nearly twice that, and money from outside sources is driving that total much, much higher. The top line numbers don't look overwhelming. Republican Congressman Steve Shabbat has raised a little under $2 million and spent $703,000, while his Democratic challenger, Kate Schroeder, has raised $1.4 million and spent $928,000. As political analyst Sean Comer at Xavier points out, the good news is that when the candidates take money, it's easy to trace donations from businesses, groups, and individuals. If the money is going to a particular candidate directly, you know, you know exactly every dollar that goes to a candidate and every dollar they spend. And that's, I think, crystal clear. 
But the money the candidates have is chump change compared to outside spending. $6.4 million already spent. That includes the national campaign committees for the Republican and Democratic parties. But it also includes murkier super PACs, where some donors are able to hide their identities. I think it makes it a little more confusing about who do you trust and who don't you trust. And where it leads us, I think, is to have a more of a gut reaction to say, well, this is probably who I would be supportive of. But I don't think it helps with clarity. Almost all of that money, $5.9 million, went for negative advertising. Let me break all that down a little. The candidates, the parties, and those sometimes shadowy outside groups have spent around $8 million combined in this race. And at least $6 million of it went for negative ads. That's three out of every $4 spent. And if it feels like you can't even escape the ads when you're surfing the Internet, well, there's a reason for that. Shabbat has poured more than fifty-three grand into online ads, the biggest chunk of that on Google. But Schroeder more than doubles up that number. Her campaign has spent $120,000 on online advertising, nearly all of it, almost $119,000, to put ads on your Facebook feed. The Center for Responsive Politics, helping us with all the financial tracking. That's an independent, nonpartisan group. And as always, you can keep up on the candidates and the issues without partisan influence on WLWT.com. Todd Dykes, WLWT News 5. Another of our WLWT debates profiled Ohio's second congressional district. I asked incumbent Brad Wenstrup and his challenger, Jamie Castle, about their positions on social justice reform. I grew up in a home where racism wasn't tolerated. Now, as far as protests, I will always fight for the right for peaceful protesting. That is non-negotiable. But I will also protect the idea that we must have law and order in our country. That is non-negotiable as well. I am now trying to learn every day how to be a better ally, to listen and take suggestions. And when I mess up, I will say sorry and try better the next time. It is so sad that this has become a political issue for some. Black Lives Matter and everyone should be able to say that. And in the 8th District covering Butler County, I asked incumbent Warren Davidson and challenger Vanessa Enoch about concerns over the security and validity of this election. Look, we've always voted by absentee ballot here in Ohio. This is nothing new. Every vote should be counted. Every person who cast a legal vote should be counted in Ohio. How do you make an election secure? You establish things like Ohio has that many states don't, voter ID. You do things like you don't mail ballots to every registered voter, you only mail ballots to people who request a ballot to the address they have on file uh, and then you match signatures when you receive them. Well, two other congressional races will be tracking. Kentucky's 4th District incumbent Thomas Massey bills himself as Kentucky's most conservative congressman. His opponent, Democrat Alexander, Alexandra Owensby, recently suspended her campaign. And Indiana's 6th District incumbent Greg Pence, the brother of the vice president, is running for re-election against Democrat Jeannie, Jeanine rather, Lee Lake. Shattering records amid claims from the president that the national tally might not be trustworthy. Next, keeping your vote safe from, store, from storage to mistakes. We're here to put on an election. We're not here to face anybody's ballot. Get an inside look at the process and how you can still fix a problem with your ballot. And you're not just voting for the top of the ticket. The big money issues hitting you right in the wallet. What you'll get and what they'll cost you.
An unprecedented election with unprecedented early turnout. Tens of thousands of voters in greater Cincinnati have already cast their ballots. Millions have done so nationwide. But early voting has raised questions about election security. Yeah, from COVID concerns to safety of the ballots to common mistakes made by voters, people have a lot of questions. WLWT News 5 investigative reporter Todd Dykes has those answers as he takes you behind the ballot. Well, not only has early voting smashed records, it's also generated record interest in how the process works. From checks and balances to postmarks and deadlines, it's hard to think of a time when conversations about ballots and ballot security were so commonplace. A beehive of ballot activity. That's the best way to describe Butler County's Board of Elections office in Hamilton. The ballots are very, very secure here. We, are, we have amazing staff that takes are totally pride in what they do. Board Director Diane Noonan knows all eyes are on her and her colleagues to make sure all votes are counted during this contested election season. It's a season that has some wondering if ballots are truly secure. You know, it does make you think twice and say, okay, bring it in person, and then you don't have yeah. to worry about it getting lost somewhere along the way. Noonan knows people are concerned, but she says two letters should give them confidence. Everything's done with, with a D and R. Meaning Democrats and Republicans work together to monitor the way ballots are handled. But what about Butler County voters who requested absentee ballots and have yet to mail them in? It has to be postmarked by November 2nd or delivered to our Board of Elections here by 7.30 on Election Day. Mail trucks have been delivering batches of those ballots daily. Trained workers examine each envelope looking for errors that could cause problems. We may find they don't sign it. We may find that they don't put their uh, last four digits of social security, their driver's license. They are contacted. When that happens to Ohioans who vote early, whether they live in the city of Hamilton or Hamilton County, they can correct it. So the very day that we find that out, we send out an 11S form as required by the Secretary of State, and then they're allowed to send it back to us with a cure so that their ballot can be accepted, or they can come down here and uh, do it in person, which, you know, whichever they feel most comfortable about. Once a voter's identity has been checked, ballots are removed and likewise examined for flaws. If all is good, each mail-in ballot is scanned into machines and held there, waiting until they are counted on election night. Diane Noonan says voters in her county should take comfort knowing there are multiple checks and balances, including bipartisan teams of ballot watchers. But when it comes to opening ballots, it comes to doing provisionals, to anything, it's a DNR. We're here to put on an election. We're not here to face anybody's ballot. Now, in addition to storing those ballots in a locked room, Noonan says there are multiple cameras inside Butler County's Board of Elections office to make sure everything is secure. Todd Dykes, WLWT News 5. If you requested an absentee ballot but change your mind, you can still vote in person. Just take that ballot to your Board of Elections before Monday. The workers will help you void that absentee ballot and then vote in person. Finally, an important note about you taking control of your vote. If you go to your polling place on Election Day and for any reason are told that you cannot vote, cast a provisional ballot. After the election, you have seven days to verify your vote. While much of our focus this election is on the top of the ticket, several big money issues will be decided across our area. Yeah, two new school levies are on the ballot. A school levy, levy in Franklin, Ohio, would pay to renovate the high school and build four new buildings. The cast is about $173 a year per $100,000 of property you own. But the school district points out that the state is picking up 57% of the cost. No construction plan in Winton Woods. Voters there are being asked to fund an operating levy. The district says it needs the money to ramp up its operations to fit the population. Leaders want to improve security by hiring more school resource officers. That money would also expand the district's preschool program, restore high school busing, and maintain extracurriculars. The cost here about $243 a year per $100,000 in property value. Those those two school issues are among 20 total on ballots across our area. Virtually all of those are renewals, but still worth millions of dollars to the school districts. We are also covering 67 other levies and bond issues. Those would pay for everything from operating expenses to police and fire departments to streets and cemeteries, just to name a few. So pay attention to your ballot and know what is on it. Yeah, we all seen these millions of dollars in negative ads flooding your TV, radio and social media feeds. Well, tonight we're investing where that money is really coming from.
In some cases, you really don't know who's writing the checks um, and who's really sponsoring the message. We'll show you how that's possible, what you should watch for when you see an ad, and the stunning amount of money being raised and spent to win your vote. And what about those web stories your Facebook friends are throwing around? How to be a smart reader and the best ways for you to spot a fake. You're watching a WLWT Commitment 2020 special. Here again, Ashley Kirkland and Stephen Albritton. Welcome back. Tonight we are focused on giving you the facts you need to know where the candidates stand on the issues. Yeah, no race bigger than the presidential election. The hard fought battle playing out for months as the candidates attack each other on the issues. Tonight we're going past the negative ads to show you what the candidates own campaigns say that they stand for. On health care, President Trump's campaign website says he has, quote, repealed the individual mandate from the Affordable Care Act, which forced people to buy expensive insurance and tax those who couldn't afford it, signed a six-year extension of CHIP to fund health care for $9 million, and mobilized his entire administration to address drug addiction and opioid abuse. Former Vice President Joe Biden's campaign says he will, quote, protect the Affordable Care Act and oppose every effort to get rid of this historic law. The website says Biden has a plan to build on the Affordable Care Act by giving Americans more choice, reducing health care costs and making our health care system less complex to navigate. On the economy, Biden says we have to start with coronavirus relief for working families, small businesses and communities. Then Biden promises to mobilize America with national challenges on manufacturing, infrastructure, the education workforce and racial equality. From the Trump campaign, the president, quote, is unleashing economic growth and jobs, saying the Trump administration's pro-growth policies have generated six million new jobs. The unemployment rate has fallen to its lowest point in 50 years and wages have grown at more than three percent for 10 months in a row. The president also noting under the president's leadership, Congress passed historic tax cuts and relief for hardworking Americans and in foreign policy. Trump's website saying the president, quote, has gone around the globe working to restore America's prominence in global diplomacy. South Korea and Japan pledged to build closer defense collaboration with the United States in Saudi Arabia. President Trump pushed for a coalition of nations to confront Iran and President Trump followed through on his promise and recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. Joe Biden's team laid out, quote, his foreign policy vision for America to restore dignified leadership at home and respected leadership on the world stage, arguing that our policies at home and abroad are deeply connected. Joe Biden announced that he will advance the security, 
prosperity, and values of the United States by taking immediate steps to renew our own democracy and alliances, protect our economic future, and once more place America at the head of the table. Getting those messages out and firing negative ads at their opponents means a jaw-dropping amount of money is being spent on the presidential race. Here again, WLWT News 5 investigator reporter Todd Dykes to show you the staggering dollar figures involved and who's raising it. Well, the who, as you'll see, can be murky at best. The how much involves numbers so big they're hard to wrap your head around. So far, Joe Biden has raised $531 million. That includes all donations through the latest filing period of September 21st. President Trump has pulled in $476 million. Both candidates are getting donations from individuals as well as businesses and groups. That's more than a billion dollars combined. And that's before you start digging into the strange world of dark money. When we talk about dark money, we should note both campaigns are benefiting and neither candidate is doing anything wrong. That's important because I'm about to talk about dollar figures so big they might have you saying that ought to be illegal. We use the Center for Responsive Politics, a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, to track campaign contributions. Most outside money comes from what are called super PACs, which can take unlimited donations but must list donors. Then there are dark money groups. These can raise unlimited money from secret donors. Here's the catch. The super PACs I mentioned, they're allowed to take unlimited donations from those dark money groups. So here's how it works. A mystery donor gives the dark money group millions of dollars. The dark money group does not have to say who the mystery donor is. The dark money group then donates the money to the super PAC and the super PAC only has to identify the dark money group, not the mystery donor. Political expert Sean Comer as Xavier says that process can really muddy the water. You, know, you have to report your donors as a super PAC, but you can take donations from an organization that doesn't have to report its donors. And so in some cases you really don't know who's writing the checks um, and who's really sponsoring the message. Tens of millions of dollars flood into these super PACs, and they're churning out almost universally negative ads. For President Trump, a group called America First Action tops the list. It's already spent more than $85.7 million. Almost every penny has gone into ads against Joe Biden. For Biden, his top outside money comes from Priorities USA Action. The group has spent more than $100 million, including $55.4 million on anti-Trump ads. Combined, that's more than $141 million in negative ads from just two groups and the hazy nature of who's paying for those ads can confuse voters. It's not, it's not the same as before when this ad's paid for by a particular candidate or by a particular political party. You know who they are and you know who to hold accountable if you don't like it. For the candidates and parties themselves, Ohio and Greater Cincinnati are a source of big money. Statewide, Ohioans have contributed more than $83 million to all candidates and parties. Most of that went to Republicans, nearly $46 million, another $35 million to Democrats. Greater Cincinnati is a big player in that fundraising, with more than $20.4 million in contributions, including $5.3 million just in Hamilton County. But there is some good news about those donations. If the money is going to a particular candidate directly, you know, you know exactly every dollar that goes to a candidate and every dollar they spend. And that's, I think, crystal clear. Now, again, we're not seeing anything illegal about the money the candidates, campaigns or outside organizations are raising. But you should listen carefully to the ads you hear. If it's paid for by someone other than the candidate or their party, there's a good chance it's paid for it with at least some dark money, meaning you'll never know who actually wrote the check or what their motives are. Todd Dykes, WWT News 5. Uh, so much money involved here mm -hmm. and millions in dark money and cash from the campaigns is also flooding into our area as the parties battle for control of the U.S. Senate. Yeah, one of the top races in the nation is the Kentucky Senate seat held by Mitch McConnell. His challenger is Democratic candidate Amy McGrath. Now, depending on the outcome of the presidential race, either three or four seats will determine which party can push its agenda through the Senate. And with a critical part of the vote coming from northern Kentucky, both candidates have hit our area multiple times. Both candidates recognizing this seat could have a far reaching impact on the country. I think the biggest thing we can do, it really is get rid of him and then see if we can make some structural changes and get us back to where we have traditionally had a Senate that has been able to work. Look, I don't own this seat. I have to earn it. And I'm confident the people of Kentucky uh, believe I've done a good job and don't think it's a good idea to transfer the majority leader job from Kentucky to New York. 
Now, when it comes to one of the biggest issues in the race, the coronavirus response, McGrath blames McConnell for the lack of a new COVID-19 stimulus package. McConnell says Democrats are pushing for a multi-trillion dollar money grab. Heading to the other side of the U.S. Capitol, every U.S. House seat is also up for election. In our part of Ohio, that includes Steve Shabbat against Kate Schroeder in District 1. Brad Wenstrup taking on Jamie Castle in District 2 and Warren Davidson challenged by Vanessa Enoch in District 8. In the Commonwealth, Kentucky District 4 pits Thomas Massey against Alexandra Owensby and Indiana District 6 features Greg Pence taking on Janine Lee Lake. Targeting our election and trying to influence what happens. These actions are desperate attempts by desperate adversaries. The foreign countries working to undermine one of the most fundamental things about our nation, our National Investigative Unit uncovers what's already happening and what's being done to protect you. Infrastructure projects, the death penalty, social justice reform for police will show you where the candidates stand in the races for key local positions that will shape the future of our region. Powerful jobs with big impacts on our lives are up for grabs in this election. From prosecutor to sheriff to county commission, they'll control millions of dollars, law enforcement and crime and punishment for hundreds of thousands of people. These are the local offices that can define a region. The winners will be the men and women who push for infrastructure projects, social service programs and social justice reforms. The candidates backgrounds and experience are varied and so are their platforms. One of the highest profile races this year, the Hamilton County Sheriff. Incumbent Jim Neal is out. Democrat Charmaine McGuffey beat him in the primary. McGuffey brings decades of law enforcement experience to the race and an eye toward equal justice for everyone. Her opponent is Bruce Hoffbauer, who has his own decades of experience with Cincinnati police. The Republican wants the department to be more proactive and fiscally responsible. The winner in the sheriff's race will send criminal cases to one of these two men, Republican Joe Dieters and Democrat Fanon Rucker running for Hamilton County prosecutor. A core issue for them, the death penalty. The issue is not about the fact that we need to punish individuals who threaten, harm, uh, torture members of our community. The issue is the injustice in the process of how we actually um, manipulate our criminal justice system to ensure that it's fair. Prosecuting attorneys are made and swore to uphold the law, not to determine what laws you want to enforce. 
Two seats are up for Hamilton County Commission. The candidates to replace former Commissioner Todd Pertoon run the spectrum of political experience. First, Alicia Reese, a Democratic former state representative, head of the Ohio Black Caucus and Cincinnati vice mayor. She compares her edge and experience to a hospital visit after a 911 call. When I get in, I don't want the intern working on me. I want the most experienced doctor with a track record of some positive results. Republican Andy Black is a businessman with limited political experience on Marymount's Village Council. He underlines his business background and fiscal knowledge. I don't have a long political resume. I've got a lot more private sector, sector experience than I have in politics. That's the point I want to bring to people is that we have enough politicians in the room. How about somebody who's gone out there in the private sector? An independent Herman Najoli, a long shot with a friendly demeanor, a handful of degrees and a focus on transportation infrastructure. He says he's the right man at the right time. I use an acronym of my first name. I say I am humble, empathetic, resilient, mature, authentic, and nice. A second commission seat currently held by Democrat Denise Driehaus is also up. Driehaus is the current commission president whose campaign touts a long list of what it calls promises kept. The Republican challenger Matt O'Neill has spent most of his career in school finance, sticking to his roots with a focus on taxes and spending. Well, as those local candidates make plans to shape our future, foreign countries are taking their own steps to knock us off our path. Are foreign countries trying to shake our confidence in our election? We have a national exclusive, a candid conversation with the man whose job is keeping our election safe, plus the top intelligence officials who say we're already being attacked. And speaking of influence, what about those online articles? We'll arm you with the tools to separate fact from fiction, the best ways to spot a fake, plus quick and easy ways to know if a picture is the real deal. Are you ready for this? Nearly $11 billion will be spent this year on political advertising. Ugh, the Center for Responsive Politics tracks the money. It says that's 50% more than four years ago. And when it comes to digital media, the presidential candidates alone have spent just over $55 million. That online spending is just for the legitimate ads. You also have to navigate the shadier world of distorted online stories. Yeah, tonight we're giving you tools to separate fact from fiction. Now, when you see a story about the world's first head transplant, it's not hard to recognize it as a fake. 
week. But in today's political climate, it can be much tougher. Yeah, so you have to pay attention to these. WLWT News 5 investigative reporter Todd Dykes joins us once again. He did the research and shows you how to spot the fake. We've all heard it. The truth can be stranger than fiction. And if ever there was a year to prove that old saying, it's 2020. But that makes it more important than ever to understand what you're seeing and whether you should believe your eyes. The first thing to do is be skeptical. That can be easier said than done with the flood of news available, especially when an article backs up your own beliefs. Do you support President Trump? Well, this article from the website News Examiner suddenly becomes easier to believe, even though it is entirely fake. From the left, this tweet showed the president allegedly wandering aimlessly around the White House lawn. Again, entirely false. The president was waiting on the first lady and even pointed out a puddle for her to avoid before they boarded Marine One. So how do you become a smart skeptic? First, remember popularity is not proof. That tweet about the president, it's been viewed more than 5 million times and it's been shared about 1,600 times. Well, that doesn't make it true. Next, you want to consider the source. The LA Times, a widely respected journalistically solid newspaper, it and many other news agencies allow you to check out the author of an article or a social media post to see their biography and what else they've written. Beware of spoof websites. Some of these are just for fun and they make that obvious. Others may be trying to mislead you. And then there are sites which are designed around confirming an inherent bias, whether that's liberal or conservative, and present everything from slanted articles to conspiracy theories. So protect yourself. Read beyond the headline. Solid journalism will always include political viewpoints from both sides of the aisle. If you only see quotes from the right or the left, that should be a big red flag. And check the form of the writing. Middle of the road journalists rarely use all caps, exclamation points, or draw conclusions about someone's motive. This one is important to remember because even legitimate news outlets will sometimes post opinion stories. Those stories should be labeled as opinion, but it's also up to you to be able to spot the difference. Now we're going to talk about another biggie, fake photos and videos. You may have seen some of these photos, which were debunked by the website Bored Panda. Technology makes it easier than ever for malicious people to mess with reality. Our national investigative unit was there as tech-savvy high school students all of them first-time voters were shown deep fake videos edited to put false words in someone's mouth. I would never say these things. It was just like, can I believe anything anymore? <laughs> like, I just, it was just crazy watching it. So look closely. Is the lighting consistent? Back to those pics from Bored Panda. Look at surroundings. Be sure they match the time and place a photo or video claims to represent. And remember, ultimately, getting to the truth is up to you. If we want to better the country, we need to make better decisions and research ourselves. Another important note, don't be part of the problem. If you see something you can't be certain is true, don't share it. Now we're posting several resources to help you spot the fake on WLWT.com, including ways to investigate a photo quickly and easily. Todd Dykes, WLWT News 5. So don't believe everything you mm -hmm. see. Now when we talk about potentially malicious election information, it's not limited to online material. New attempts to influence your vote are coming from two of America's oldest adversaries. Here's Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. These actions are desperate attempts by desperate adversaries. At a hastily called nighttime news conference, the director of national intelligence announced another election influence operation against America is underway. Iran and Russia have taken specific actions to influence public opinion relating to our elections. Specifically, U.S. intelligence agencies say Iran and Russia have obtained voter registration details on Americans that are already being used to flood voters with misinformation, including, Ratcliffe says, Iran sending spoofed emails to intimidate voters, incite social unrest, and undermine the election. The emails were sent in the past 24 hours and targeted multiple states, a U.S. intelligence official tells the National Investigative Unit. Don't be alarmed and do not spread it. We are not going to tolerate foreign interference in our elections. Earlier this month, in an exclusive interview, Bill Evanina, who leads the election security effort for America's intelligence agencies, warned just this sort of attack would come. Are foreign countries trying to shake our confidence in our election? They are. They're using aggressive forms of disinformation and influence to influence the voter. At the end of the day, their goal is to influence the voters uh, with respect to where they want their geopolitical uh, goals to be. And I think the voters need to understand they're the ones being influenced. Wednesday night officials also warned of fake videos used to mislead Americans as they choose the next president of the United States. 
in Washington. I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. Well, we are only a few days away from Election Day, but the question is, if you still haven't voted, we're going to show you what to expect. People are very excited about casting their ballot. From the boards of election to the lines to the mail, what you need to know to make sure your voice is heard. Already this election is making history more early voting than ever before, including counties here in our area, seeing more than double the previous record. We are now less than a week away from Election Day, but for a variety of reasons, voting this year has turned into Election Month. Yeah, from the pandemic to concerns about potential suppression, voters are turning out like never before to make their voices heard. Early vote, early vote today. The Hamilton County Board of Elections expected a huge turnout before Election Day, and they've already blown past it with five days of early voting still to go. More than 50,000 already nearly double the number in 2016. As for those absentee by mail ballots, 178,000 requested, 135,000 already returned. I will stand in line and however long it takes. I don't care if it rains. You know, I love this country so much. In Claremont County, another crowd. The line of voters outside of the Board of Elections office, quiet but determined. The choice for many voters is clear. Hit the polls early and avoid any potential problems on Election Day. Never voted early in person. This is something totally new for us. Uh, the weather is usually awful on the day of, and we were honestly a little bit nervous about long, long lines. And while requests for mail-in ballots has favored Democrats in most places, in person points to a state still very much up in the air. <laughs> Go Trump 2020. Uh, we got to get Trump out of there. It's scary. Officials stressing they don't care which candidate you're there to support. They are there to support you. People are very excited about casting their ballot. Well, so with six days left to cast your ballot, here's what you need to know. If you haven't requested an absentee ballot, it's almost certainly too late to do that by mail. If you have a ballot already that you haven't mailed yet, remember it must be postmarked by Monday or delivered by you in person before polls close on Tuesday. Now, if you want to vote early in person, here's the rundown. Tomorrow and Friday, 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. Saturday, 8 to 4. Sunday, 1 p.m until 5 p.m. and Monday from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. 
Of course, you can always vote on Election Day itself. Polls are open from 6.30 a.m. until 7.30 p.m. So many opportunities to cast your vote. Now, you can find all of that information on our website, WLWT.com, and on the WLWT mobile app. Click on our Commitment 2020 section to see the voting times, as well as the big races in your area. There's a lot on the ballot. And where the candidates stand on the issues, from the presidential battle right down to local races. And that's where we will leave you tonight with proof that no matter our differences, democracy is thriving in America. Yeah, whether it's on Election Day or early in person, we encourage you to take part and vote. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.